Hi Quilty friends and welcome to my little spot in Podunk. My name is Leanne and today um, we're going to talk about the pressing boards. And I just wanted to show you um, a little bit about them before we actually start making them. And this is my most used board and the oldest board. It's just a piece of plywood. It's 12 by 12 and it's about an inch thick three quarters an inch thick. We got it um, out of the garage. My husband's always building something, but you can you can get these at Home Depot or Lowe's. They're already cut. Um, you can also get these at Hobby Lobby and Joann's. They have small pieces of cuts of wood. And you just pick whatever size works best for you. Um, I've got three different sizes. So the second one that I've got here is a little bit bigger and it's made from a wood shelf from an old entertainment center. We've taken that shelf out um, to put a stereo in there and we weren't using the shelf and I decided to cover it. And it's, it's not a good piece of wood. It's got laminate, wood laminate on both sides of press board, but it is held up really great. But I don't, I'll admit, I don't use it very often. And before we go on, look at the <clears throat> my largest one. I want to talk about fabric that I cover it with. I try to find the cheapest fabric that I can. This is a Riley Blake fabric, I do believe, but I got it really cheap online um, on Etsy, I believe. So, and it was cute, so I covered it. But most of the time, I'm using like Walmart or Joann's fabrics to cover these with because, you know, it's just going to get rent as an ironing surface. I do a lot of ironing as I'm sure you do. So here's the biggest one, and this is my main pressing surface in my sewing room, and it's covered with a mode of fabric. This is Bonnie and Camille fabric, and here again, I got it super cheap online, so um, it's not that expensive. And you can, um, once these get dirty, take them off, throw them in the washing machine, and wash them, but most of the time, I'm in such a hurry that I just recover over top of the fabric that's already on there. Um, and I'm going to turn this around so you can see it. This is just, you know, another piece of wood. It's a piece of plywood. Um, and it's got probably three or four layers. Looks like there might be th three layers of fabric underneath there. So, and then what I'm using to support it is a dresser. This is just an old dresser that I've painted. And underneath it, I've got tops that I've taken off or ironing surfaces that I've taken off and washed and they came out fine. So I put them underneath there so I know where they were at. Now this is a home deck fabric. Home deck fabric works really well. This came from Joann's, got it really cheap with one of those coupons. Um, and then underneath that, I've got an old quilt that I was used to learn free motion on. It doesn't even have a binding on it. I put it on top there to protect the dresser just in case I ever wanted to use it again for something else, which is very doubtful. Um, and it keeps the board from sliding around um, or scratching the top. But you could actually um, permanently fix it to the top if you wanted. We just chose not to do that, and this works out really well. I don't have any trouble with my board sliding around, but I'm in a unique position to where I'm butting it right up against my sewing table back here. So, you know, if it's not one to, st to stay stable for you, then you'll want to take it and um, glue it down or screw it down. I don't know, whatever it is you want to do. But this dresser, um, you would think that it would have pressing supplies in it, you know, starch and all that. But this dresser just holds quilt tops and backing um, and binding. These are, there's like 30 quilts in here that need to be quilted. So I can just pick it right back up and put it right back up on there. And I don't have a bit of problem with it. And I've been using this for um, about 10 years. This one I've been using for about four or five years, but it doesn't see much action. And this one gets used often. I probably replaced the cover on this, oh, uh, I would say every two to three months, sometimes more. It just depends what I'm doing. If I'm doing applique, it gets replaced as soon as it starts looking yucky, which is usually with, with every applique project. All right, that's it. Let's head over and start making us a pressing board. All right, before we get started, let's go over the tools that we're gonna need. And the first thing we're gonna need is a hammer. You might need a hammer and you might not, so it's not a necessity. 
A pair of needle nose pliers. Needle nose pliers are just pointy, so you can um, you may need those um, if you're going to take out staples, and we'll get into that later. This isn't an absolute necessity, but they're handy to have. You aren't going to need it to cover the board, but if you're going to recover the board, you might need them. And a screwdriver. That's, this is also another tool that you might need if you're going to be taking out staples to recover your board. This is a flathead screwdriver. You can get, if you don't have these, um, go to some place like Harbor Freight or Walmart and just buy a cheap one. And then you're going to need a staple gun. This is the most important thing, a staple gun. And if I were you, I would test them out um, before you buy them. They range in prices from really expensive to really cheap. And then you're going to want some staples. The ones that I'm using today are 3 eighths of an inch um, long and that's how long it is here. Now you don't have to get really long staples. The shorter the staple, the easier to get out of your wood. This just happened to be what um, Mr. Podunk had in his garage, so that's what I took. <laughs> All right, a board, whatever size board you want. Today I'm gonna to be working with a 12 by 12. So today we're just going to be doing the small one, but it's the same process on all of them. And cheap fabric. And then you're going to need a rotary cutter for cutting your fabric and your batting. And a ruler if you want it nice and square. And I'm using cotton batting, two layers of cotton batting. And then we're going to need some heavy duty aluminum foil. Does it have to be heavy duty? Um, I just find that heavy duty it's heavier and it's not going to rip, it's not going to give you any problems, so I want it as strong as possible. Um, that's why I use heavy duty, but I also use heavy duty in my kitchen, so it's really up to you. You could try the thinner stuff to see if it works. I really couldn't tell you because I don't know. All right, so now that we've got all of our tools, let's get this thing put together. Before you start working in your sewing room on this board and doing the things that I'm doing, I would suggest that you cover your work area. I have used just tissue paper that you use for um, Christmas time, putting in boxes, and I've covered my cutting table because I don't want to make a big mess. So the first thing that we're going to do is um, cover this with our aluminum foil. I'm going to be using quilt basting spray to hold all my layers together. So I'm just going to spray my board. And the reason why I use quilt basting spray is because it's temporary. It's meant to work with quilting and I don't think it's going to harm any of my fabrics and I've not had any problems in 10 years. Then I'm just going to take my aluminum foil and lay it on top of that board and smooth it out. Now you're probably wondering why we're using aluminum foil and the aluminum foil Make sure your rings don't scratch up your aluminum foil or it's not going to serve its purpose. It serves two purposes. It's going to bring the heat back up instead of in, into our pressing and it's going to keep moisture out of our wood because what happens to wood when it gets wet? It swells up, it warps, and that's not good. Now I am not going to spray it to the back. I'm just going to fold it over and really we should fold those corners in first like this. All right, so there's our first layer with aluminum foil. So the second thing we're going to do is we're going to spray this aluminum foil. It doesn't take much, just enough to get it to stick. And just place that right on there. And if we need to readjust it, we can because this is just quilt basting spray. It's meant to be moved. So there we go. We've got our first layer on. And just like the first time, we're going to spray it again. Just a little adhesive and bring in our second layer of cotton batting. Now I've cut my cotton batting to about two inches larger than what I need to cover the back of the board. And these two layers <coughs> give us kind of a cushion so our quilt blocks can push down into it or if we're doing the bigger board our quilt can push down into it and give us those really good creased 
flat seams like you see with um, wool pressing mats. So one more layer and you're thinking what else could there be and it's something else that I forgot to tell you about. I like to do what I called a, a barrier layer. This is just a white piece of fabric. Um, nothing special about it but it's I leave it on here all the time and it just serves as I don't know a barrier it's just more cushion and I never take this off when I recover this stays on there so now what we're going to do is flip it over to the back <clears throat> okay first thing we're going to do is just pull that corner up and staple it down um, I like to staple the batting separate, every layer separate. We'll put it that way. Just pull it up and give it a little staple. I'm picking that up, getting it a, a little bit taut so it doesn't want to shift around. And then I'm going to do the other side, same way. And over here, pick it up, just give it a little snug. Now, since we got that glue on there, it's probably not going to move too much, but um, you still want it as snug as you can get it. And then we're going to fold this in. This bulk that's in the corner is kind of is going to serve as legs, is what it's going to do, and it's going to keep our board up off of our table so it doesn't scratch the surface. Not that we're not going to protect our surface because we are. Okay. Now here's where the hammer might come in handy. That staple right there is just sticking up a little bit more where I didn't get enough pressure. You just whack them like whack-a-mole. Yeah, whack them in there. You don't want those sticking up, scratching your table. What I'm going to do is take this and just fold it under like this. That way it's going to be underneath the our final border piece, our final not border, what is it? Our final piece of fabric. So, with fabric, we're going to pull it snug, okay? You don't have to get real snug, especially on this first side, but when we do this side over here, it's going to need to be snug. So let's just put like four or five staples in here. All right, now we can take this and turn it around. This is where you want to pull it snug. You want those layers nice and snug. You don't want no wrinkles. That would be bad. Fold that down. Nice and snug. And we're going to start from the center this time. I'm going to fold that a little bit more. Right in the center. It's snug. All right, last edge. Let's just fold that in. That's far enough. The back doesn't have to be pretty. This is supposed to be functional. Let's make sure it's nice and snug. Oh yeah, nice and snug. Oh my word. It's trying my patience. I could have made this thing 10 times and that never done that. You turn that camera on 
and this is what happens. All right, there we go. We're cruising now. Okay, cut off that excess. We don't need that. Now it's to add our last layer. <clears throat> now with this last layer, we want it to come up over this edge all the way around. And what that does is puts those staples at a different level. Okay, you want to make sure that you've got enough fabric coming in past, you want it to go right on the wood. Okay, we'll just deal with it like it is. All right, so we're going to pull it up snug, but not real snug, because we're going to pull it from the other side real snug. And we'll do four or five staples. Now we're stapling out here in the wood. And that puts the staples down in the wood and this lip edge or you know that thicker where it's thicker the batting and stuff will hold it up off your table so you're not as likely to scratch any surface that you've got in your sewing room and i like coming right to the corner and see there's one i'm gonna have to smack with a hammer whack-a-mole Then we turn it around and you get her nice and snug so that way you don't have any wrinkles. You don't want any wrinkles in this and this was ironed so um, you know it's already been stretched out a little bit. You just want to make sure that when, if you choose to iron, I don't iron very often, I press, that you're not going to get a wrinkle. So we're going to pull that nice and taut and if you don't like that fuzzy edge there, you don't like a raw edge, by all means turn it under as long as you've got enough to stick a staple in it. I can feel where that other fabric's at, so I'm going to have to, you know, feel with my finger and then lean that forward. Oh, yeah. Oh, for pity's sake, y'all, what a day, what a day. That one's not close enough for me. That's going to rip. There we go. That'll be a whack-a-mole. You guys ain't going to have this much trouble, I'll tell you that, because you're going to buy a better tool. Don't buy this brand. This is a Pro Shooter. Ah, uh, I've got another name for it, but um, YouTube might get mad if I put some profanity in here, so I won't do that. I think that was the last one. Nope. I'm not very good at figuring this thing out, am I? never had so many troubles with my stapler and we're going to do the corners the same way just pull it in cover it up
Now, I don't know if you guys can see that, um, but these corners, because I've left the fabric all bunched up, have kind of made their own little legs. And um, I don't know if you can see that, how that's bunched up there. And that's going to keep all these staples up all these staples up off of any surface we put it on. But I don't know if you can see that. They're kind of puffed up right there. And that's how you do it. No matter what size you make, um, do it exactly the same. If you're doing a big surface and your aluminum foil does not come all the way to the edge and you have to split your aluminum foil in half, like do two pieces, Let's pretend this is aluminum foil. You've got a piece of aluminum foil here and you need another piece of aluminum foil. You're going to overlap it, okay? But you're going to spray the surface right here with your basting spray, okay? That way it seals and no steam will get down to your wood because that's what makes all the difference. Do you guys want to do a little test? I've got a wool pressing mat and a, and this, and we'll, Put them up against a, like a little challenge, a battle. Let's do it. All right, for our controlled study, <laughs> sounding real scientific, aren't we? We're going to start with um, some quilt shop quality fabric. As you can see, I've got um, an RJR design here and a Moda. And I'm going to cut some four inch squares. I'm going to make some half square triangles because that'll give us some nice bulky seams to work with. But I just wanted you to see that um, I'm not cheaping out on you. We're going to be using some good fabric. And I'll just cut some corners off here. And then we will um, add starch and press on both boards. But I wanted you guys to see that um, everything is done exactly the same. There's no difference. It's going to be the same starch, um, the same pressing technique, same amount of time, and then the only difference will be the pressing boards that we use. And I'll be using uh, one with wool and the other one with the, the mats that I made. Okay, after I cut these, I'm going to go ahead and starch them, and I'm going to use my pressing board just for starching these and pressing them initially. Um, after I get these starched, I'm going to we'll make a little makeshift clothesline and put a fan up here to dry these really quick while I clean the sewing room up a little bit and go fold a load of laundry. And then um, I'll start making some half square triangles. Now that they're dry, I'm going to press all of them on my board, and this is the last time that all of these will be pressed on my board. I forgot to square these up to four and a half inches, so that's what I'm doing now. And now it's just um, run these through real quick and make some half square triangles so we can get them pressed. Okay, and what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to mark these so I don't get them confused. And we're going to take a chance here. I'm going to use a blue water-soluble marker. I'm just going to put a W on it. Let's do it on the back. W for wool. And we'll put a P for podunk. Now I'm just pressing these on the wool mat and they're each getting pressed to the count of five and then I'll press mine with the P on it on my mat and then I'll come back over here and sew these half square triangles together in sets of two.
I'm just going to lay it right across that seam. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Now we're going to turn that over because I see I'm doing that all the time online. Let me make sure that's going to open up. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And we're going to turn it over. Look at all them threads. My mercy. Okay. Now I'm just going to press the middle seam only. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Are you guys ready? Are you excited? Which one do you think is going to win? Do you think there's going to be a winner? I can tell you I've done this uh, test before. And I'm going to move this up here really close, really close. Move it over this way. All right. So we've got the wool on this side. Okay. I'm going to. Here, how about if we do this? We'll shake it, shake it, shake it. So there's the podunk one. There's the wool one. Let me see if I can see it. And both, there we go. Do you remember? Wool. Leans. Podunks. So we could push on it. Mm. What do you think? Do we have a winner? Should I zoom in a little bit closer? Um, so we can get it to focus. Whoa, sorry about that. I'm trying to get it to focus. There's the wool, right? The wool. And the podunk. Let's push on this one. This is the wool. Podunk. So, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to let you all make your own decision. And um, say that I personally don't like wool mats for one when you press on this the wool this has an odor this isn't as bad as some of them that I have used but it still has an odor and if you're going to buy a wool pressing mat you'll want to cover it with cotton even if it's just a little piece of fabric that you lay over top of it because once you scorch it it's scorched forever um, economically I think my boards are the way to go simply because they're you know it's cheap I wanted you guys to see the difference um, in how they pressed if there is a difference um, I'm not I can't justify putting out a hundred or two hundred dollars to cover my big board or my big surface with a wool pressing mat um, the one that I saw was 59 inches by 22 inches and it was $189 and it's like wow I don't even have that in the materials that I've used in the last 10 years to recover this big board and I just I don't have a problem if my seams don't lay completely flat but I never have a problem with my seams not laying flat over the years I have been um, <laughs> adding layers and layers and layers to this pressing board and I didn't realize how many layers there were I thought there was only like two or three but I wanted to show you how many there actually is and these first two layers right here are um, they stay on there they're the original to cover up the batting and the aluminum foil but I've got one two let's see there's two three four five layers of fabric 
So you, when you recover these, you don't have to always take that off. Actually, having all those layers is kind of nice when you press your block. It kind of presses your block down into the fabric and makes it lay a lot flatter. What I want to do is I've, I've started removing the layers, but I wanted to show you how to remove these um, should you want to. And this is, it gets a little bit harder the closer to the board you get, but I've got just a flathead screwdriver and I'm going to try to push underneath that staple with the, the tip of the flathead screwdriver and just bring it up to where I can get a hold of it. And so the having the extra layer of fabric makes it a lot easier to do. And some of them that are like on the wood, they're hard to get underneath there. And if you can't get underneath it, just push it down right beside it really hard and you should be able to get underneath it. You're going to make a little dent in the wood, but that's no big deal. And that's another one. So I pushed down really hard and pulled up. All right. Then I've got a pair of needle nose pliers and that's to, to get underneath those staples and pull them out. And just do that all the way around until you get down to the layer that you want. So what did you think of the little challenge? Do you like a wool pressing mat? Do you hate a wool pressing mat? Leave me a comment down below and let me know. I'm always interested to hear what other people think and my opinion is not gold. <laughs> it's just my opinion. I think other quilters need to know what other people think about the wool pressing mat and the homemade pressing boards. You know, it's um, that's what being a quilter is all about is sharing our knowledge to help others out and you know what works for one quilter may not work for another and that's okay it's all about making beautiful quilts all right so back to the pressing boards um, and I removed the covers and I wanted you to see that I washed them I washed them by hand in a wash pan about this big and I used seven parts hot water to one part ammonia and every once in a while, I don't know how often, I would just go in there and kind of squish it around with my hands. And um, then I rinsed them really well two or three times. And all of them came out pretty good. I could actually use most of these in quilts if I wanted to. They came out so well. This one's got a couple spots on it, but it's not too bad. And um, there's one more, this one here. Um, I think I would have to probably bleach it if I wanted to actually use it again in my stash, but I'm going to use all these more than likely to recover my boards um, instead of putting them in my stash. But you know, you never know what can happen. I'm one of those really thrifty gals. If I find a need for one of these fabrics, I'm going to do it. <laughs> but uh, that's all I have for today. But I wanted to show you some pictures somewhere around in here of what, I'm, what I've been working on and what will be coming up by the end of the year. And there's a lot more. This is just a little sneak peek. If you've not subscribed to my channel, you'll want to subscribe and hit that little bell. That way you don't miss any of this cute stuff. Thanks for stopping by, guys. I love you. I'll see you in a few.